Welcome to the Relationship Diversity Podcast, where we celebrate, question, and explore all aspects of relationship structure diversity, from solaramory to monogamy to polyamory and everything in between, because every relationship is as unique as you are. We'll bust through societal programming to break open and dissect everything we thought we knew about relationships, to ask the challenging but transformational questions, who am I and what do I really want in my relationships? I'm your guide, Carrie Jaroslow, best-selling author, speaker, intuitive, and coach. Join me as we reimagine all that our most intimate relationships can become. I'm on my 2,000th, 150th day of daily self-care. Back in 2016, I didn't think I could find any time in my hectic life to do a little yoga or meditate. My kids were three and seven, and I had a small but demanding business. I had zero time in the day to myself. I couldn't even go to the bathroom without a child opening the door. I was strung out, exhausted, and had completely lost myself. I'm an introvert and an empath. The combination of those two aspects, when left unbalanced, can lead to overstimulation and major fatigue. I was giving everything I had to everyone and everything in my life except me. I was ignoring all the signs of exhaustion, short temper, resentment, depression, apathy, and running on adrenaline to get it all done. Until one day, I found myself alone in the car, on my way to get some medicine for one of my sick kids. I forgot to turn on the music and sat in silence as I drove. When I realized that there was an absence of noise, My mind zeroed in on the silence, and the sound of it was so glorious, so beautiful that I burst into tears. And then I realized that I had no idea what was really going on within me, what I thought, how I felt, who I was. I was certain that I wanted to know myself better, but I had no idea how to begin the process even though I had done this in the past in my 20s and 30s. That's how lost I felt. So as I always do when I don't know how to do something, I closed my eyes and I said this to the universe, show me the way. Show me the way. Please show me the way. And it's as if the universal consciousness had been waiting patiently for me to ask this question because almost instantly I heard the words start small. And then this was followed by the image of taking care of myself, of some kind of self-care. Now, I had always known self-care to be something like a massage, a 60-minute massage, or a yoga class where I go to the local yoga studio and spend 90 minutes on a class and then travel time on top of that. And this is why self-care never happened for me. There was never a way for me in this busy time of my life for me to take anything more than maybe 30 minutes to do something good for myself. So the word start small was a game changer for me. Instead of trying to do a longer self-care practice and failing miserably because, let's face it, it never happened, I had the idea to come up with a minimum practice. This was something that was three minutes a day, and I knew that I could find three minutes every day to do something good for myself. And when I embraced this idea of the minimum practice, I started to feel successful because I felt like that, like this was something that I could actually fit into my day, three minutes a day. And so I started with a seven day goal. And by the time I got to the seventh day, I felt amazing because I was, I felt accomplished. And, you know, I was proud of myself for showing up. And then I extended my goal to 31 days, one month. 
after about 28 days, I injured my shoulder doing crow pose and I was doing yoga. And I was just motivated to continue. So I altered my practice and continued to show up. And after about 45 days, I ended up in the hospital overnight. I still did a little yoga in the hospital with tubes hanging off of me, even though it was really uncomfortable. At 60 days in, I started waking up more and more to myself. And 90 days in, six months in, I started to really feel more of a connection to myself. My family even began seeing a difference in me. My oldest son would ask me, have you done your yoga for the day, mom? And after consistently showing up every single day, even when I didn't want to, even when I felt like I phoned it in, even if I felt like I just laid on my back in Shavasana for 15 minutes, I started to see self-care differently than how I had originally thought about it. So here are some of the things that I learned in my almost six years of daily self-care. The first is, and the most important, is that self-care is about connecting to self. Sometimes it's a reconnection, and for some people, it becomes the first time that they intentionally connect to themselves. For me, I had lost the relationship to myself that had taken years to cultivate in my 20s and 30s. I was a very different person, so I had to learn who I was as a business owner, a wife, and a mother of two children. Another is that self-care gives you a toolkit for challenging difficult times. A self-care practice is just that, a practice, a way to learn and exercise a muscle for when you really need it. By committing to three minutes each and every day, self-care became a normal and easy part of my life. Then, when I was struggling, I had many things I could do to help me process and understand what was going on for me in the given circumstance. I learned that self-care is essential. It's not a luxury. As I filled my own container every day, my self-care became my lifeline. Those days where I felt so depleted by all my obligations, I came to my yoga mat and felt a moment of release and breath in my hectic life. Many times it gave me the energy to finish my day or go to sleep feeling more gratitude and presence. I learned that self-care is about creating a deeper intimacy with myself. And when I connect deeper to myself, it teaches me how to connect deeply with others. By creating space for me to give to myself, check in with myself, and see how I'm really doing, and ask myself deeper questions, I became more intimately connected with myself. I looked into me. It's what self-intimacy is. Into me, I see. And by knowing myself so intimately, I was able to be that and find that intimacy with my partners. I also learned that self-care helps me to teach myself self-acknowledgement, self-acceptance, self-compassion, and self-love. Quieting my mind a little bit every day helped me to see what was going on underneath all the noise of my life. I was able to become aware, acknowledge, and accept my feelings, even the ugly ones, and show myself that it's okay to feel all of it. In the challenging times, I felt like my yoga mat lovingly held me in its arms, but it was really just a symbol for me giving myself the space to just be wherever I was and whoever I was in any given moment. When we allow this within ourselves, we attract people who are able to meet us in this space. I learned that daily self-care creates a built-in space every day to check in with myself. I knew that I had space every day that is a part of my daily routine. So if I get triggered by someone, I would come to my self-care practice with curiosity to understand why. Self-care meets me where I'm at. When I sit on my yoga mat, I'm just me, the me in the present moment, the elated me, the sad me, the joyous me, the hopeless me, the hopeful me, 
the messy me, the angry me, the anxious me, the peaceful me, and so much more. I don't have to put on a brave face if I feel scared, confused, or hopeless. This freedom helps me to accept where I am in any given moment and helps me understand all of the complexities that are are a part of me. Self-care is also my time to take off all my masks and roles and lets me just be me, which also contributes and helps to me knowing myself without the labels. It helps me create a strong foundation of identity that ends up informing more authentically all the roles that I have in my life. I also had experiences where self-care opened me up to new inspiration. Many times my self-care gave me and gives me the space for the mental chatter to quiet for just a few golden minutes. In that quiet, I open up to inspired thought, those thoughts that don't come from me but seem to come through me. I've written books, come up with programs, ideas for social outreach, and solutions to problems all during my self-care practice. And lastly, I learned that self-care doesn't need to cost anything. The belief that I needed money to do self-care kept me stuck. And then I got the inspiration to look on YouTube and was amazed at all the content generous creators put on the platform. I could probably do a different yoga class every day for 10 years before having to repeat one. There is yoga, meditation, martial arts, music, exercise, and so much more on that platform. And then there are a myriad of activities that can be done outside and nature. All of it for free. So as you can tell, I've learned a lot in those over 10,000 minutes of self-care. And I have also learned what self-care is not. So here are some common misperceptions that I found. One is that self-care is selfish. I grew up thinking that anything I did for myself was selfish. Yet I found that when I took some time every day to focus on me, I had more of myself to give to those around me. I also found that I was able to give without resentment and give with love. And another misperception is that I needed to have a lot of time to do self-care. This one really tripped me up. And it was why I never got around to doing anything nourishing for myself. I would say to my husband, I really want to go do a yoga class this week and have great intentions. But like I said before, the idea of taking 90 minutes never materialized into form. I gave up and just resigned myself to the idea that when things slow down, I'll have more time to do self-care. This pushed it way out into the future in some made-up future moment that I was hoping would show up, but never really believing that it would. So in that rare quiet moment when I heard start small, my mind opened to a possible solution, a solution that I put into action on January 1st, 2017. And what I did is so easy. I'm going to lead you through the four steps I used so that you too can develop your own unique daily self-care practice. So step one was make a list of what you love to do, what feels really good to your mind, body, and spirit. It could be the more obvious self-care practices like exercise, movement, meditation, journaling, And it could be something outside the box, like singing, playing an instrument, cooking, or knitting. I chose yoga for mine because I've been doing yoga for almost 30 years, and it really brings me a sense of peace. And I knew that when I did yoga most of the time, and there's so many different kinds of yoga, that it would feel really nourishing to my body, mind, and spirit all at the same time but make it personal to you, make it unique to you. You're unique. That's my whole message with this podcast. So list what feels really good to you. And step two was developing a minimum practice. A minimum practice is something that's no more than five minutes and that you can do anytime and anywhere. 
So for me, it was three sun salutations, which if if you don't know anything about yoga, takes between three and five minutes to complete. So think of this scenario. It's 1145 at night, dark and rainy out. You have 15 minutes to get your self-care practice in. What do you do? So some examples could be following your breath for three minutes, stretching, singing a song, thoughtfully petting your dog, doing a guided meditation, taking a shower or a bath. And having a minimum practice already in your back pocket will be your answer at 11.45 to, I don't know what to do, so I just won't do anything. And step three is document what you do every day. I started documenting my self-care from the beginning. It looked like this, January 1st, 2017, day one of 31, or day one of thirty of 365. Now, I also noted sometimes what I did and if it was something that felt really good and I wanted to do it again, or if it was maybe a yoga practice on YouTube that didn't really resonate with me and just wanted to make note of it. This is the cool thing about documenting that as you start to see the numbers rise, it's like a physical manifestation of all of the perseverance and um, work that you're doing to put into filling your own container. So as I saw the numbers rise, I felt more motivated to continue. When I got to day 100 of 365, I felt so accomplished. And lastly, step four, find an accountability buddy. This would be someone who you feel would really support you and possibly want to do their own self-care practice. It's always helpful to find someone to cheer you on and motivate you while you make your self-care muscles strong. Sending each other a short text that says, did you do your self-care? I did. Or checking in about self-care is all that's necessary. You can also take it a step further by coming together to set intentions and goals and connect with each other regularly to make sure that you are following through. It also gives you someone to come to when you feel like you really don't want to do something and that someone can give you the motivation and be your cheerleader, giving you the encouragement you need to keep going. I read a study that found that people needed between 21 and 250 days to form a new healthy habit, with the average time falling in around 66 days. Understanding this and knowing that you'll probably have some resistance during the process sets you up to move through them more easily. Thoughts like, I don't feel like it today, I'm too tired, or I have too much to do, will most likely run through your mind at some point or another. So here are some thoughts that have helped me move through the resistance and keep up my practice. Even if you don't feel like doing it, do it. This is the time you pull out your minimum practice. You tell yourself, it's only three minutes, and I can show up for myself, and I'm worthy of this three minutes. Even if you feel like you only gave 10% and you weren't present or you felt like you were just going through the motions, come back the next day. I used to judge myself when I came to my yoga mat and my mind was elsewhere for the entire five minutes. I found this to be another form of self-sabotage, taking the expectation of how I should be showing up and just did it in whatever way it was done, helped me accept and love myself even more. I became grateful that I just showed up because some days that was really all I could do. Follow your rhythms and honor your feelings. If you feel like doing something that's slow and restorative, do it. If you're called to do something energizing, do that. We live in a society that always says we should push it. We should push through things, always, no matter what. But by listening to how you feel and consciously, lovingly responding with a practice that honors your present feelings, you begin to cultivate self-trust. And here's the last thought. That self-care is meant to be nurturing and supportive. 
If you feel like you should work out because it would be good for you, this wouldn't be considered self-care. It still may have a place in your life, but it wouldn't be self-care because there's an obligation attached to it. What feels really good to you? Maybe taking a bath, petting your dog, or singing a song. Think about that when you're coming up with your list. What feels really good to you? The new year is right upon us. This is a great time to review how the previous year has gone and make intentions for what we want to experience in the new year. Could this year be your self-care year? To support you in this, I have a free guide to develop a daily self-care practice, and I'd love to send it to you. The link to get it is in the show notes. Sign up and it is mailed to you right away. If you want to take it a step further, check out my Self-Care Made Easy program. In this online program, I go deeper by helping you understand the unique reasons why you want to start your self-care practice, what might be blocking you, practical tips to move through those blocks, as well as a step-by-step process to develop your own unique practice. I also give you practical tips for showing up in this way every day. This helps you learn to know yourself, accept yourself, and love yourself more and more. It develops your self-care muscle so that you can flex it when you really need it, having a wide toolbox to move through those challenging times. And by developing this intimate connection with yourself daily, you'll get clearer on what you want in a relationship and the types of people you want to be in relationship with. It will help you know how to be your authentic self within the relationship, as well as how to honor your needs and desires while in them. So I'll ask you, how will you choose to start 2023? The choice is yours. You are worthy of spending this important time filling your own container. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what I think because I can't make you do anything. It all starts with you. I believe in you and I hope to offer you care, support, and encouragement on your journey. Until next time. Thank you for listening to the Relationship Diversity Podcast. Want to learn more about relationship diversity? I've got a free guide I'd love to send you. Go to www.relationshipdiversitypodcast.com to get your sent right to you. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast. You being here and participating in the conversation about relationship diversity is what helps us create a space of inclusivity and acceptance together. The more comfortable and normal it is to acknowledge the vast and varied relating we all do, the faster we'll shift to a paradigm of conscious, intentional, and diverse relationships. New episodes are released every Tuesday and Thursday. Stay connected with me through my website, carriejarislow.com, Instagram, and TikTok. Stay curious. Every relationship is as unique as you are. wondering why you never seem to find lasting fulfillment in your relationships? Or do you create the same kinds of relationship experiences over and over again? Can you never seem to find even one person who you want to explore a relationship with? Have you just given up hope altogether? If this sounds like you, my recent book, Why Do They Always Break Up With Me, is the perfect place to start. The foundation of any relationship, whether intimate or not, is the relationship we have with ourselves. In the book, I lead you through eight clear steps to start or continue your self-exploration journey. You'll learn about the importance of self-acceptance, gratitude, belief shifting, and forgiveness, and given exercises to experience these life-changing concepts. This is the process I use to shift my relationships from continual heartbreak to what they are now, fulfilling, soul-nourishing, compassionate, and loving. It is possible for you. This book can set you on a path to get there. Currently available through Amazon or through the link in the show notes.